Well, thank you for coming and thank you for staying around. I think we got a little bit of a ring here now, at least that I'm, I'm hearing on my end. The, uh, Jeff and Leslie should be coming back this next week. I took a few weeks off to get a break. This last two weeks, I've shared a little about prayer. Two weeks ago, we went through Jesus' teaching on prayer through the Lord's Prayer and some of the principles there, the God who calls us to pray. And it's an expression of a walk, uh, of a walk with the Lord. And it it's means that God is designed for His will, His kingdom to come to, to earth, which is in itself a, a mystery and an amazing thing. Last week, we talked about uh, dealing with the issue of discouragement in prayer. We covered a couple of parables that Jesus taught about prayer. The, the relentless neighbor who kept knocking on the door and uh, getting his neighbor to give him some bread in the middle of the night because he wouldn't quit knocking. And the neighbor who finally gets up, okay, okay, I'll give you your food. Just, you know, stop knocking. Or the parable of the unjust judge who, who finally gives in and relents and gives justice to a widow not really necessarily for the right reason, but because she's just wearing them out. And, and both of those parables are, are illustrations of, of lesser to greater. If you got imperfect scenarios, imperfect people, imperfect friends, even unjust judges who sometimes they'll do the right thing, even if not always for the right reason, how much more do we have a God in heaven who loves us? And he says, keep knocking, keep asking, because Every believer, if you seek the Lord for long, I'll, I'll wager you struggle at times. Am I praying enough? Lord, are you there? Are my prayers making a difference? What's, you know, what's going on, Lord? So this uh, Sunday, I want to also follow up. It'll be on the theme of prayer. But instead of so much a talk of, uh, about instruction on prayer, as much we'll go through a passage where God calls us to pray, to seek Him, to turn to Him. In Revelation, there's a couple of, of uh, passages, Revelation 5 and Revelation 8, where the picture that's painted is incense going up to the throne of God mixed with, mixed with the prayers of the saints. God wants us to pray. He delights when His people cry out to Him. So today what I want to do is go through a passage from Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah, of course, got to give a little bit of history, was a prophet from approximately 740 B.C. to 681 B.C. That's, those dates are approximate. We aren't given exact time frames. He was a prophet during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Uzziah was a good king. Jotham was a good king. Ahaz was a, a very wicked king. Hezekiah was another godly king. So, but it was also a time with a lot of upheaval going on in Judah. A lot of people were turning away to idolatry and mixing worship of the Lord with worship of idols. And there was increasing political and military pressure. The northern kingdom of Israel, until it went into captivity, was a, a military threat as were Syria and Assyria. And the, the, the political dynamics of align, who do you align yourself with somebody? Do you not align yourself with anybody? There, there's a lot of upheaval going on there. So that's, that's a lot of what Isaiah is living through. He's going through a time of uh, when God's people need to seek the Lord. According to Jewish tradition, he was sawn in two by the wicked king Manasseh. We don't have, the Bible doesn't tell us how he died. That's Jewish tradition, but it's very possible, if not likely, when the author of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews 11, writing about some of the saints and the sufferings that, that godly people did for the faith, and he said they were sawn in two. Very possible, if not likely, he was alluding to Isaiah and probably others who may have been martyred in that manner. In Isaiah 55, I just, I'll start with the first few verses and then I'll, I'll dig into the latter part. Isaiah says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. 
Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. We live in a culture with all kinds of things to allure us away from God, right? Isaiah, it's nothing new. He's talking about a time how so many are being drawn to the the pleasures of the world or to things that ultimately don't provide satisfaction in life. How much is that happening today? Is it any different? Whether it's what we see on the internet, whether it's videos, whether it's whatever we're doing, how many times are we being drawn to a materialistic world where where it's, it's making promises of satisfaction through wealth or power or political greed, or any number of things. But he says, you know, ultimately, they aren't going to provide real satisfaction. So with that, with his backdrop, I'm going to pick up with a little more concentration then at at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I just want to key in on a few key points that Jesus or rather Isaiah, uh, speaks to us here. And he, he says, first of all, seek the Lord. Call upon him. As I said, God wants us to come to him. He wants us to pray. He wants us to seek him. He's not a distant God. Jesus revealed him as our father that we can pray to. He's not a God who just holds us at arm's length. He wants his children to come to him. He's urging us. He yearns to hear us cry. He wants us to draw near to him. But he also says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. That word while shows up twice. That imports a temporal element to the the urging from God. By direct implication, it says there can come a time when it's too late to call upon him. There can be a time when it's too late to seek him. It's worthwhile for us to remember that uh, this life is a vapor. It's a passing shadow. When I was young, it seemed like time just drug by. Doesn't work that way when you get older, does it? You know, it's, I look back and, and how much has happened, how much it disappears so quickly like a vapor. None of us is guaranteed tomorrow. I don't matter, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how old you are, none of us is guaranteed tomorrow. So there's that element of it, and the Apostle Paul writes, now's the acceptable time, now's the day of salvation, now's the time to turn to him. But there's also the warning in scriptures that if you hear the gospel and you hear the gospel and you reject it and you refuse to respond, there can become that hardening of the heart. That's a dangerous place for any of us to be in. So uh, there's a certain urgency there. Call upon him while he's available. Call upon him while there's an opportunity. He says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. It's a call to repentance. Turn away from our sinful ways. Turn away from, from living and thinking and conducting ourselves according to our ways, but instead turn to the Lord. And he says, let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God is eager to forgive those who come to him. When we come to him in repentance, he's eager. In Ephesians, the Apostle Paul talks about how he lavishes his grace upon us. You think about it. You think about a, a, a lavish gift. What is it? What's a lavish gift? It put you know, in your mind just something, whether it's a husband who buys a, some very expensive jewelry or expensive clothing or whatever. 
something that's lavish. It's not just barely meeting out the bare minimums to get you by. God is eager to lavish more than just the minimum amount of grace to get us into heaven. He desires to give us his abundance. The Apostle Paul talks about how where sin abounded, grace abounded even more. His grace is more than enough. And, and he isn't in heaven there saying, well, okay, I'll give you just barely enough to get you by for now, but, you know, shape up. He wants to lavish his grace. He's, he's a God of mercy. But he goes on to say, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. God's way of living is immeasurably higher than anything that we can come up with. And to this day, men want to create their own separate reign on the earth, don't they? That, that's, it goes back to the Garden of Eden. You don't have to do what God said. You can do what you want, then you can be God, knowing good, good and evil. The book of Genesis talks about the Tower of Babel, where they were building this great tower this great powerful thing that they were going to have, basically a monument to themselves in, in reaching to the heavens. And God was not pleased and he divided their tongues and cast confusion into their ranks. Is it any different today? How much is espoused today in the name of science or medicine or political theory that's really just our own efforts to erect our own Tower of Babel create a system, a way of living independent of God's word, independent of, of the way he wants us to live. What are our thoughts? When he talks about let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, what's he talking about? For starters, it, it's, it's get into the issue of, of our worldview. Do we have a biblical perspective on how we view the world, of how we analyze the things that we see around us? It also relates to what do we let our thoughts dwell on? What do we meditate on? What do we focus on? What, what, what is it that you desire? When you're alone, where do your thoughts go? What is it that you yearn for, that you dwell on? What, because our thoughts will govern our actions. They will determine where we go. God challenges, challenges us to learn to think as he does. He wants us to dwell on his word, to think his thoughts, because that governs how we live. There are a number of verses and passages that discuss that. Just a few in passing. Psalm 1 it says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the path of the sinner, nor sit in the seat of the scoffer. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And the psalm goes on to say about how the man who does that is, is analogous to a, a tree planted by, by waters. It's freshly watered. It's always bearing fruit in its season, a fruit that endures. God calls us to have a fruit that remains, but it's got to be something that's watered by his word. In Romans 12, Paul writes, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. So that by testing it, you may learn what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. One little note there, the word transformed is in the Greek metamorpho, which Probably can figure out what word we have in the English comes from that. Metamorphosis. The caterpillar that changes into a butterfly, for example. Caterpillar doesn't look much like a butterfly, at least to me. By the renewing of our mind in God's word, we can be transformed into something far different from what we started out. By his power, by his grace, we can be transformed to something very different. Likewise, in Ephesians 4, Paul again says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new self created in the likeness of God and in the right likeness of righteousness and holiness. And in Colossians 12, he says, Set your mind on things above and not on earth, for you have died. 
and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So, in other words, our thoughts matter. What we allow our thoughts to go to make a difference. The worldview that we adopt, that the, how are, are we going to follow the world's standards on morality, on godliness, on, in, on, on any number of things? Do we stand for what the scripture reveals? And then also, what do we meditate on? What do we focus on? Certainly one area is in the area of sexual temptation, but that's not the only one. Do we brood over bitterness and anger from the past? Hurts, offenses, do we have a hard time letting them go? The lure of wealth, oh, if only I had this, if only I had that, if I only had these things, then I'd be happy. You know, what, what is it that we focus on that we turn to? So moving on then, Isaiah says, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that for which I purpose it. And it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. He, he paints a picture of rain and snow that, that comes to the earth, that waters the earth. That's what enables the crops to grow. That's what we're, we get flowers and, and crops. Without water to nourish the earth, things dry up in a hurry, don't they? The analogy is God's word can water our souls and can bring forth a fruit in our lives that that satisfies. As I said that in the first part of Isaiah 55, he says, why are you chasing the things that don't really satisfy in the end? Turn to me, learn to live by my word, and there's a, there is a, a new fruit, a life that you can have. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Lord says, man doesn't live by bread alone. That's to the Israelites who just gone through 40 years in the wilderness where they're fed day to day by manna and water that would flow from a rock with basic sustenance. But God said, I brought you through this because I want you to understand you need more than bread to live. You need the word that comes out of the breath of God to truly have life within you. And his word is what provides an eternal food. But when we turn away to sinful desires, we aren't getting the nourishment. But when we turn away from our sin, when we seek him, then we can receive a, a, fresh, a fresh awakening that comes through him. And Isaiah talks about, you know, you'll go forth in joy. The mountains and the hills will bring forth in joy before you. You shall go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it will make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The picture that's painted is creation itself is worshiping and glorifying God. The trees clapping hands and, and, and so on. Of course, God made creation and he designed it so that man could enjoy creation with the creator. So there is a, a time and a place when it's a wonderful thing to be able to enjoy a mountain, enjoy a valley, enjoy whatever. But more than that even, when we can enjoy the creator of that creation. And there's a joy and a worship that we can give and a life and a peace that comes when we do that. The beauty of God's creation reveals something of his glory and power and he created us to enjoy it with him. So as we turn to the Lord in repentance and we seek grace to obey him, the Holy Spirit moves from within. His Holy Spirit is that water into our dry hearts that can bring forth fruit, that can produce something of eternal value. And even though we may face tests and trials today, 
and we do. We can find a joy, a peace that endures, that sustains, that encourages us. The image right there refers to the cypress and the myrtle. The cypress probably was an evergreen tree that grew up in Lebanon. One thing about the cypress is it's full of resin. So that means it tends to resist decay, it tends to be fairly long lasting, holds up well in the, the weather. The myrtle, on the other hand, also was a, an evergreen tree that was, grew in that area and in particularly around the Sea of Galilee. And one thing about it is it had a certain fragrance that could be appealing. The imagery that's painted there is instead of the, the ugliness of sin, instead of the, the, the dissatisfaction, the thorns and thistles of our rebellious lives, when we turn to God and seek Him to, to live as He desires, He produces a fruit that can endure that doesn't decompose, that doesn't decay, and he can produce a fragrance in our lives. Paul writes about the fragrance of the aroma of Christ. And as I say, our prayers can be as a fragrance of incense to the Lord in seeking him when we turn to him. So let's we'll take a, just a few applications here. I, it's a time for us to pray, to seek the Lord. Appreciate the fact we're praying for the nation, praying about the elections. We need to pray about those things. We need to pray for those in authority. It is a time of a lot of stress going on. But the message here isn't so much about interceding for others, it's what? It's for us to come to the Lord, right? We're gonna have communion here in a few minutes. Where does judgment begin? There's a lot of corruption and evil, and it's, it's very frustrating for anybody who's concerned about it. But where does judgment begin? Does judgment begin in Washington, D.C.? Does it begin in Congress, or the White House, or the Supreme Court? Does it begin in the state houses, or the city halls? Does it begin in Hollywood, with what kind of movies they're putting out, or other entertainment? It's not what the Bible says, is it? Judgment begins with you and me. It begins with the household of God. And, and Peter adds, and if it begins with us, with the household of God, what's going to become of the wicked? So it's a, a good starting point for us to always remember. It starts with you and me. A fresh awakening, a revival, whatever you want to call it, it starts with our repentance. Are we holding on to thoughts? that are not pleasing to God? Are we participating in things that do not please him? What, what is it that we yearn for? Do we desire to draw near to God to dwell in his presence? His ways are immeasurably higher than everything else we come up with. And if we turn to him, his word will not fail us. We fail, I fail, we all do. We miss the mark. But God will never fail us. And if we turn to him and put our trust in him, his word will not fail. And he is eager to, to pardon his children. He's eager to minister grace. So if we turn to him, we can find an eternal fruit that can change us, that can create something of the aroma of Christ. So take a moment to pray. Lord, we turn to you. Lord, anything in our hearts that's not pleasing to you, anything that is not of you, we ask you, Lord, cleanse us, purify us. We need your grace, Lord. Teach us your ways afresh. Teach us to fear you, to, to follow you, to seek you. Help us to turn back to your ways, to your thoughts, put our trust in you for your word to bear fruit in our lives for eternity. And we pray in the process that we might be more conformed into your image, that we might give you glory, and that the fragrance of Christ would flow in our lives.
We take time to seek you now, Lord. Reveal in our hearts any thoughts, any ways that are not pleasing to you. We seek you. Cleanse us afresh. In Jesus' name, amen.